Hello and welcome to a special bonus episode of Half Hour Mentor with me, Ian Cleverdon. If you're new to this audio podcast series, the main aim of it is to support anyone who wishes to work on their personal and professional development with inspirational advice from successful people from a variety of backgrounds. Each one of them has been there, done it and is still doing it. Two series are available to date with Series 3 launching in September 2023. Listener feedback has also shown that the episodes, lasting around 30 minutes each, have been very popular with anyone who was interested to hear about the backstory of successful people. At the end of every episode, I ask my guest what one piece of advice they would give their younger self, knowing what they know now. Invariably, this can stretch to two or three pieces of advice, but the comments have proved to be very popular and helpful. Therefore, in the lead up to series three, I thought I'd prepare a bonus episode for each of the first two series that focuses on these golden nuggets of advice and inspiration. This episode features my guests from series one, most of whom are leaders in their own fields, ranging across business, finance and education. Series two focused on the creative arts and those advice highlights will feature in another bonus episode out soon. Let's start with Professor Paul McGee, international speaker and best-selling author who focuses on change, resilience, motivation and inspiring leadership. His book, Sumo, Shut Up, Move On, is a Sunday Times bestseller and has been translated into 12 different languages. He's a very successful presenter and expert on personal and professional development. So what was his advice? I think it would be just to accept that life is a roller coaster. It's not my quote, but it's a quote that people might be familiar with. Don't let success go to your head and don't let failure go to your heart. And I think there's been times, Ian, when I've allowed, you know, I've come off stage to a standing ovation and you think I can take on the world. And then there's other times when things haven't gone well and it's I feel like it's the end of my world. Paul, just acknowledge it's a roller coaster. Don't let success go to your head and don't let failure go to your heart. That's a really interesting and memorable tip from Paul. It sounds easy, but how would you put it into practice? Let's hear from multi award winning business mentor and entrepreneur Helen Tonks. Helen is also CEO of Inspires Me Consulting Limited and co founder of Hydraulics Online Limited. She's also an active contributor to the government's Help to Grow scheme, which supports small business growth. Her one piece of advice actually turned into three, but they were all golden. Let's hear from her. Never be afraid to be yourself. Don't try and bluff or be anyone else. Just be your authentic self. And um, that comes from a place of having hidden in the background of um, my first business for nine years, because I thought if people realised that I was this non-technical woman in a very technical industry very male dominated industry and I happened to be married to my business partner partner I just didn't think that people would take me seriously and I've actually proven or I've now realized that being in that position is my sort of um superpower um I'm going to throw in network like crazy like mad but in a good way make sure you give back and you're not always taking um and it would be around um there's a, there's a quote that I love, comparison is the thief of joy. And linked on from that, it's the idea of um, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to somebody else is today. So always be striving, always be looking to improve, throw yourself in the deep end, grab those opportunities, but treat yourself kindly as well. And don't measure your success by somebody else's benchmark and achievements. Helen's phrase, comparison is the thief of joy, was one of the most resonating phrases of the first series, judging by listener feedback. Just be you, but measure your continuous improvement from your own performance, not necessarily others. After all, we are all different. However, a common issue faced by most of my guests, and most of us, if we're perfectly honest, is imposter syndrome. Surely this wouldn't be a problem for someone who has served in government, has been in the cabinet as well. Here's Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, on how he developed from university onwards. You know, I went through university uh, waiting for the tap on the shoulder. I'm sure you know, many people of my generation and my background would have done the same. And mm. even in Parliament, you kind of think sometimes that you're going to 
kind of come up, you're going to reach your limits and therefore, you know, you're going to kind of feel as though you've, you're out of your depth. And, you know, that's just sort of in the DNA, I guess, you know, it's kind of comes with the, comes with the background, doesn't it? And mm. I, I had to constantly teach myself that, that I wasn't going to hit those limits. I could keep pushing on and, you know, and that was, that's always been a, a challenge all my life, to be honest. I always kind of had to battle that sense of, I can't do that. And I've had to convince myself that I can do that. And, you know, it often would be something that would take a few months or even a couple of years, but then slowly I would get into a new environment, feel acclimatised, and then I would be okay, and then the next step. So it was only when I actually put my name forward for Lee that I started to say to people, I want to be an MP, and was quite, you know, found it able to say that and yeah. and not fear somebody sort of ripping me to pieces yeah it's that imposter syndrome that a lot of people oh, yes. go through you know i mean it sounds awful as a phrase but virtually everybody goes through it think am i worthy of doing this particular role definitely and i'd say to anyone who who's listening to this who feels a bit of that you know recognize it you'll still feel it nothing i can say will take it away mm. so you'll still feel it mm. and you'll go into a you know a kind of university setting or into a work setting and you'll immediately feel like you have kind of been let in by mistake or that you know you're going to get found out and that that absolutely was a feeling i had all the time what i would say is recognize the feeling and just take it steady and hold yourself there you know, get used to that environment mm. and then you'll start to feel different and, and and change and you'll you'll start to kind of kind of own it you know i remember i always say this but you know i was at Cambridge and I kind of arrived and just was totally disorientated in my first year I couldn't and didn't think I was going to stay there I thought I would not be able to last the course and you know as I've always said you know I came up against people who just looked more confident and more impressive than anyone I'd ever come across <laughs> you know in my life and it took me probably until the end of my second year to work out though they sounded amazing they were talking complete rubbish and then when I realized that I then thought right well I <laughs> I can, I can, uh, I can do better than that. And I, I yeah. but it's it's definitely something I would, and I, I and I think it's not just a sort of let's say a working class thing. I think it it affects everybody really to some degree or other. And I would say just recognise it and work with it and work around it, and you'll overcome it. It's so refreshing to hear from someone talk about vulnerability, from someone who is constantly in the limelight and therefore always facing critics as well as supporters. What was Andy's one piece of advice? It's got to be that point about have a bit more inner confidence about your place and why you're there. You know, you're, you're in... When, it, when you're anywhere, you've got there for a reason. You've not got there by accident or chance. You've got there because you've got what it takes. And I think just always remember that. You know, when you walk into a room, you know, don't do it with, like, your head down and, like, trying to find that... You know, you know, walk in with the same confidence as everybody else you know and I, and I you know you can't just do that straight away but you can do it once you you know you can sort of build that sort of a uh, confidence do get your probably shoulders up a bit more and just don't be in any way daunted by you know people who may have a posher accent or a you know different education or you know life has told me that the more if you can be both rooted and confident that's a brilliant, a brilliant place to be. And, you know, I think some of the best people I've met in my career are people who are rooted. So people are often one or the other. They're rooted on the, and they're not confident or they're confident and they're not rooted. And I think, you know, try and, try and re always remember who you are, where you came from, why you're doing it, what you're all about. But hold your own then and, in the, and speak with that confidence when you're in those circles. Take a pause before you walk into a room for a meeting, interview or gathering and be confident and rooted. Great advice. I used to be a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University and a tip I used to give my students when discussing presentation skills was to imagine that they were going on stage before they started. Pause, take a deep breath, smile and then enter. Talking of university, let's focus on the journey from being a student and how your early career can develop. Most universities provide students with lots of employability support, not least because one of the key metrics that they're judged on is called graduate outcomes. In other words, what percentage of their students have gained full-time employment within 18 months from graduation? In a moment, we'll hear from a new graduate at the time of recording and an alumna who has forged a successful career in financial services since graduation. 
Firstly, though, let's hear from Dean of Manchester Metropolitan University Business School, Professor Hannah Holmes. Hannah is also Deputy Pro-Vice-Chancellor of the Business School's Faculty of Business and Law. She studied economics at ManMet and ended up joining the university as an associate lecturer, having studied for a master's degree at the other well-regarded Mancunian higher education establishment, University of Manchester. She shared with us some of the insecurities she experienced when studying and starting her career. Let's have a listen. Oh, I should definitely tell younger me to stop worrying about what people think. My goodness, like what a waste of time. <laughs> I think the most liberating thing when you get older is just suddenly thinking I just actually don't care. <laughs> Not, you know, I do worry. I do make sure I'm nice to people. But I think ultimately if I, if I am trying to, if I'm working hard uh, academically back then or now in my job I'm treating people the way I would like to be treated and considerate of them and trying to do my best then actually if other people don't like me but I feel I've done everything possible I have to just not worry about that but honestly when I was younger that was just that would tear me apart I worried so much about what people thought which is I think why I wouldn't admit that I really enjoyed learning because you know that wasn't what you did you, you you didn't like school. Um, so that would be definite advice to me to not worry about what people think. And then the other thing I think is kind of to back myself a bit more. I think I, I would play things down quite a lot. So, you know, what I wanted to do or how much I understood about doing something, I'd, I'd, I'd not play dumb because I didn't ever play dumb, but I think I wouldn't necessarily speak up when I knew answers or uh, had suggestions on how things could be done because I don't know I just always wanted to be the quiet one in the corner <laughs> and just not really have attention to me and for people to not realize that I would have ideas on how things could be done differently so I kept quite quiet and I think actually I could have contributed loads more at uni if I'd have just backed myself a little bit more and not worried what people thought and had a bit more confidence and haven't got any confidence now <laughs> Like, I still have people tell me all the time, which is why I do think mentors are so important about being confident. And I know from the outside, people will think I'm hugely confident and they'll look at things that I've achieved. And I know that if I looked at another female who, you know, was in my position, I would think that. But I don't know. I think we're all racked with self-doubt and concerns and I don't know what I'm going to do next. And I'm going to get found out at some point. <laughs> I think there are, <laughs> there are many people in that situation that uh, we realise them certainly in talking to them. But interesting that you want to be the quiet one in the corner to being the dean of the business school. I know, but even now, you know, I want to do a really good job <laughs> so that I don't draw attention to myself or anything other than the business school doing really well. Like, I don't like attention on me. It's everyone else yeah, that you want is. the attention for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely that. In each series, I try to include at least one person who is either at the start or in the early stages of their career. This was driven by my early research, where younger listeners in particular not only wanted to benefit from the wisdom of those with many years' experience, but also hear what some of their contemporaries are experiencing. In August 2022, I interviewed Shuaib Gamot, a successful first-generation student who had just graduated with first-class honours. What was his advice? I think the one thing that I would say to my younger self is, even if I didn't know it, a lot of my insecurities were the reason why I was so nervous about life. So I think the first piece of advice, or the main piece of advice would be, relax. Um, it's all about small steps in life. You, one day, you're not going to change your life around and, and be the person that you want to be. Um, so these small, sustained steps of slowly building towards your, to your goals and ambitions are so important. And I look back at myself when I was 18 and I think to myself, a lot of the, uh, the, one of the main reasons why I pushed myself so much was because I didn't believe that I could succeed. Um, and it, could, it couldn't have been further from the truth. So I think the first thing is to relax, but also focus on what you want in life and make sure that every day, every week, you're making small steps towards achieving the goals that you want to achieve. And... Another thing that I would really advise myself to do and I look back on, I think probably my one and biggest regret that I have is not enjoying the life moments. You know, when I graduated a couple of weeks ago and I went for breakfast by myself on my day of graduation because I realized that in a lot of these moments, I don't actually reflect and think to myself, you've done well here. 
every time I've achieved something, got a good grade, it's always what's next. You know, don't, don't, don't rest on your successes. But it is important to take them moments in, remember them and, and, um, and be proud of yourself. And that helps you in sustaining that work ethic to take them small steps to succeed. You'll be interested to know that just before the recording of this episode, Shuaib has been accepted to study a public policy master's degree at Oxford University, having been awarded both the prestigious Political Leadership Scholarship and the Academic Futures Scholarship, which has helped make his dream become a reality. It's a fantastic achievement. Well done, Shuaib, and we wish you every success in the future. And I just hope that you'll come back on the podcast when you become Prime Minister. Rebecca Ellis is a technical development manager with the global financial services firm De Vere Group. Having attained a first class honours degree from Manchester Metropolitan University Business School back in 2014, Rebecca pursued a career in financial planning within the UK and now lives and works in Dubai, where she trains other graduates and colleagues. What advice would she give her student self knowing what she knows now? My piece of advice would be to reflect more. So it's very easy to go through those student years and the first few years of being a graduate not really think about what's going on in your life so I would think about what's going well for me what wasn't going so well and areas that I can improve on so I think even now reflecting is really important just to take a minute or an hour out of your day every week or so and just have a think about where you are and what you need to improve on. It's becoming clear that reflecting on your successes and where you can improve is a common theme here. Let's now hear from Kelly Noon. Kelly is a self-employed business and educational consultant who specialises in helping overseas students and employees working in the UK improve their cultural understanding and equally helps UK businesses have a better understanding of different cultures and how this impacts on their communication. She also shares some advice from her student years. So I think there's two pieces of advice really that I would love everyone to to hear and these were two pieces of advice that were given to me. The first one was when I was doing my work experience shadowing the judge and I was still considering potentially working in the legal sector, he told me at the time, he said, Kelly, put off making any decisions. Study something that you are genuinely interested in and then when you've done that, make a decision about your career later. Because I think very often we think we want to do something and we almost force ourselves to continue a path when actually you're not getting out of it what you thought. And it's really important, I think, to have the opportunity to allow yourself to go, oh, actually, yeah, maybe this isn't right. So I think that for me was really, really helpful because otherwise I would have ended up doing something I didn't want to. And the second piece of advice, which was fantastic, and this came from a business mentor recently, he just said, ask for the business. And I think very often we don't just ask for what we want. And it was so simple, but so, so useful. He said, you just ask, just ask. (laughs) And I think if I'd known that earlier, I would have just asked for a lot of opportunities that maybe I would have really been able to embrace and enjoy. So I'd love other people to be able to just have the confidence to say, actually, could I, and and ask that question that that you wouldn't do otherwise. Yeah, because ask for the business is often seen like a selling skills tip, isn't it? And just closing the sale. But actually that's the same about career opportunities and professional development is just ask to see. Because, you know, if you've made an impression, the chances are the answer will be yes. You just sometimes have to force it. Yeah, and people love to help. Yes. If you ask people and say, I'd love your, your, even if it's just your experience, your advice, people love to help. So just ask. (laughs) It's as simple as that. Just ask whatever the question is. A common area where students and career professionals alike struggle and often ask for guidance is with interview technique. Here's an extract to help with that from my interview with the sumo guy, Paul McGee. Let's focus on job interviews for a moment then. What would your, let's say, your top three tips be um, for just really helping somebody prepare and handle interviews? What I would say, I mean, there will be three tips ultimately, but first of all, I think when you do your first one or two interviews, you put the work in, you put the effort, you do the research. My concern is that when you start to get a number of interviews, if you're not careful, you become complacent. So I have I have interviewed people in the last sort of few years. I've been developing my team. Uh, we tried to get some people involved in doing sumo for schools, which is like the, the children's branch of, of sumo. And I would interview people. I'd say, tell me what you know about sumo. And someone would go, um, is it a book? It's a book, isn't it? 
Um, I said, yes, it's a book. Have you read it? No, but I'm thinking of reading it. Oh, well, that's great. You know, you're out the door. You, you show some respect to your employer or potential future employer. What do you know? Really research the job and research the role and also research the kind and think about the kind of questions you'd like to ask. So it's obvious advice, but you'd be surprised how often people overlook it is be, you know, in the I think it was the Boy Scouts had this be prepared motto. And I do think it can still um, mark you out. My my daughter is involved in, in a management position in hospitality. She has to interview people. She's staggered. People stumble across a job, you know, opportunity and they don't put the preparation. Preparation. So number one, whole thing around preparation and research. Number two is be a bit of a politician because when politicians are trained get some media training they'll often be it lost often said that the the politician doesn't always directly answer the question and what they've been trained to do is to make sure that whatever points they want to get across in that interview with the media however the questions are asked those points are put across now, how does that relate to you uh, as someone who's going for a job interview? You really want to kick yourself if at the end of the interview, you say something along the lines of, well, they never asked me anything about this or I wasn't given a chance to shine. I think at times you need to think, what are the two or three key things I must make sure I get across of this interview about myself and whether the questions directly lead you to that or not, you don't leave that interview until you think you've actually put across the key things you wanted to ask. So be prepared. Think about what the key points you are wanting to put across, whether you specifically ask the right questions or not. And thirdly, it's more the post interview. And it's what I talked about earlier on, which is to do some reflection. And to ask yourself, OK, you know, what worked well? What was I pleased about? Um, and also, what could I learn from that experience and perhaps do differently next time? And I remember one job interview I went for many, many years ago when I was just getting over my illness. And he took me to the cleaners, the interviewer. And I'm so glad he did because I was poorly prepared and I've thought to myself, I will never experience that feeling again in my life. And I never did. So to recap, Paul's points were number one, presentation is key. Number two, be a politician. Make sure that you find a way of getting over the key things that you want to cover off in the interview. And number three, make sure you do a post interview review. So how important is preparation in our success? Let's hear from stand-up comedian and managing director of Big Comedy UK, Brendan Riley. I suppose I'd be harking back to something we've already spoken about is preparation. Work hard at preparation. Work hard. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whether you work, I used to race motorbikes, work harder at preparation because when I was younger, I wasn't as confident as I am now and I'm still not an overly confident person. But the more I prepare, the more confidence I have given the situation, whether that's going on radio, talking to a sponsor, going on stage myself, or even comedy workshops, I prepare more, be aware that you have to, the more you prepare, the easier it is to execute whatever that task may be. Resilience is another key skill to develop. And we had a masterclass in this during my interview with award-winning keynote speaker and storytelling coach, Ricky Arundel. Coming out as transgender at the age of 52, Ricky faced considerable discrimination and had to completely change career from sales and technology as a leading gender and diversity speaker, including having delivered two TEDx talks. So what was Ricky's advice to their younger self? I, I think overall, I've had a really varied life. Uh, and I've enjoyed the things that I've done, the places I've been. I've, I've had great opportunities. I've traveled the world. I've had tough times with very little money and I've had times when things have been quite good. And in some ways, if I hadn't had that, then I wouldn't have such a, a, a good grasp on what life is really all about. Um, if I changed gender earlier, obviously it would have totally changed everything. I know that the career path I had as a man 
would not have been open to me as a woman if I'd been born female. As a trans person, it definitely wouldn't have been available to me. I would have struggled to get a job and I would have been drawn down you know, some very different paths. So, so I think this is the thing. I it, It's only when I think about, oh, God, I missed that opportunity. And then I look back and think, right, what would have happened if I'd taken that? What would not have happened? And then I start to realize some really important things in my life would not have happened if I'd gone that other path. So I'm one of those people who believes you, you don't have regrets. Somewhere along the line, whatever path you've gone down, um, there is something important that you have to learn. That's why you took that path. Last, but by no means least, I return to the very first episode of the series in which I interviewed Tim Williams. Tim is the Chief Executive Officer of Oxford United Football Club and Visiting Professor of Manchester Metropolitan University Business School. Since graduating from Manmet, he's forged a hugely successful career in finance, initially with KPMG and McCann Ericsson, and then moved on to executive roles with Manchester United, Inter Milan and Tifosi Capital and Advisory. From that, you can tell he's had great success in professional development and progression by moving to different organisations. So what advice would he give his younger self? It's a really good question, and it's actually not a question I've really asked myself um, too often, although now being a much more, uh, hopefully, integral part of the university, it's certainly something that I'm kind of keen to talk to some of the students about. And I think for me, the one lesson or the one thing I would tell myself is, is just be patient. Don't lose your ambition, but be patient and use the people around you, speak to them and be honest with the people around you. I've said this before, don't quit when you're having a bad day. Quit when you're having a good day. And it's a really important lesson because if you're down, if, you, if you're struggling, whatever it is you're struggling with, then the most important thing is to tell somebody, is to talk to somebody in, you know, your line manager, their line manager, HR, whatever. The one thing I've found over the years is that organisations are very supportive of their staff, probably even more so nowadays than they were even 30 years ago. There is a real duty of care to people. Nobody wants to see an unhappy employee go. Nobody wants to see an unhappy member of the team leave to go somewhere else. Because that, A, isn't good for the organisation, it's not good for the individual, and it's not actually good for the place that they're going to. So it's really important that you make those decisions with a clear head. And yeah, for me, it's, it's patience. I think the final thing I would say though, and this is certainly from my personal perspective, is just enjoy what you do. Find something that you enjoy doing. Find people you enjoy working with. Find a leader that you can learn from, but find a leader who will pull you along as well and get you on that journey with them because there is nothing more empowering and there's nothing more energizing than feeling that somebody's got your back, that somebody wants you to succeed. It's the most powerful feeling you can ever have in your career. Don't quit when you're having a bad day quit when you're having a good day with that quote i've had so many comments from listeners about how well that's resonated with them in their career journeys tim also recommended that you find a leader who can help you and pull you along that's the exact aim of this podcast series if you pick up one piece of advice from the episodes that helps you to continuously improve i shall consider my work done if you've already found that the advice given by my guests has helped you, please share it by adding a comment to either the relevant podcast platform, sharing it on my social media platforms, or emailing me directly. All those details can be found in the show notes. I do hope you've enjoyed this retrospective of Series 1. If so, please share it with anyone who you feel would benefit from listening. Also, go back and have a listen to the full episodes if you haven't already done so, as hearing the backstories allows you to put their advice into the context of their journeys. You can find out more about my guests from the links in the respective episode show notes. It'd also be a great help if you could rate and review the podcast wherever you get your pods. 
If you're an educational institution or a business looking for professional podcast production support and you like the approach that I take in my production style, please do get in touch. I'm a freelance podcast producer and composer and would be happy to discuss your requirements. My contact details can be found in the show notes. Well, that's it for now. Thanks very much for listening and stay tuned for a similar advice compilation featuring my guests in Series 2 very soon. Until then, bye for now. Thank you.